Welcome to No Agenda. I have with me four beautiful ladies who are all very good friends of mine. Uh, we are all in North America. We happen to be all moms and we find ourselves in this discussion of racism and sometimes in an awkward place being somewhere in the middle of the color spectrum. Uh, I wanted to get their take on how they feel about being in this discussion. So sometimes I feel like I'm a part of this because this is happening to me too. And maybe in some ways I am acting inappropriately as well. However, at other times it feels like this discussion is not so much about me because what's happening to the black community is so much worse than what possibly has happened to the brown community that maybe it would be rude for me to step in and sort of talk about my own pain when someone else is in so much more pain. So I wanted to see what you all feel about this. I think we've all been, we've all gone through this at some point of time. I feel, I mean, it's not uh, the intensity, of course, Black Life Matters, you know, that is important. People need to raise it um, uh, much more than what it has been raised for uh, all along. But I guess we, also need we, we've also experienced it so it's not less I wouldn't call it that theirs is more or ours is less it's you know it hurts as much as it hurts them um, the intensity might have been more and they have been number of years that they have suffered has been more but still when you walk across the road and somebody calls you something go back to your country or you know something of that sort it still hurts so I wouldn't say that, uh, I wouldn't undermine ourselves and say that, no, it's okay, and I'm fine with it. I'm sorry, I'm not fine with it. Right. Uh, with the racist remarks that I go through, be it uh, in a work environment where, like I said, very subtly, somebody called me, I'm the whitest brown person. So it did hurt. I didn't know how to react at that point of time. Um, but later I realized, you know, that, that, was, that, was, that wasn't meant in a good way. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't undermine myself. Yeah, and I agree with what Nitu is saying. Uh, maybe the extent might be a little different than what uh, the black community is facing. Uh, there are very subtle ways of uh, racism, you know, um, which we face and probably because we react in a subtle way, but it is definitely there. And uh, the second part is, uh, the way we actually handle, I would really like to appreciate, you know, the whole community because it could be because of our background, because we we were not independent like 70 years ago, right? From uh, where we came from, we all came from. And uh, so we technically were oppressed, but not made slaves and brought to a different country, you know? So that could be the reason why their behavior is different than how we behave and handle uh, the same oppression. You know, so whenever we face any kind of such oppression and such racism, we try to have our our actions do the talking by getting good education, by, by having a better behavior and then make a difference, like going up in either whether it's the political ladder or whether it's in career or for corporate section, we, we try to let the our, our uh, education and our behavior and our uh, progress do the talking for our race. Right. Pooja. Um, yeah, I, I kind of agree with both me too and Sook. Um, also, at the same time, for me personally, I feel like we face it in a more subtle way. Again, like, you know, Black Lives Matter and like racism for the Black community is is very different than what we face. It's more systemic and it's like they've been oppressed for a very long time. So I think it's different, but fundamentally racism is racism. It can take different ways and shapes, but uh, you know, it, you can't call it with any other name. I think it's the, the reaction that we have as a community. And again, like I can see myself and I can see some of my friends. It's our desire to fit in is so much sometimes that we don't really see it as racism. We don't call it out as that. So I think it's somewhere 
that desire again going back to Suk's point of like you know that we just want to fit and we want to again like you know our actions should speak louder than words so I think it goes all kind of ties with that desire that we have because we want to look good we want to be good we want to sometimes maybe please everybody so like that subtle racism did not probably bother me in the beginning when I moved here but as I'm growing older and as, I'm, uh, you know, I think it's really starting to bother me a lot more now. But when you see so much of it around in very subtle ways, I think you reach a point where you feel like, okay, this is real. This is happening. And I think for me, that's where I am now. Right. So I think, Priya, you're in a unique position amongst the five of us because the rest of us are first generation immigrants. We moved here when we were in our early twenties, whereas you were very young. You were not born here, right? No, I came when I was nine though. Right, so what's your experience like? Has your experience also evolved? Like Pooja said that in the beginning, when you're, when you're new to the country, you somehow doubt yourself and you think maybe I'm reading too much into this or possibly again in my so case, like, it just feels like maybe I really don't understand the lingo or I do not get the jokes. So maybe I'm reading too much into this. They didn't mean it like that. Has your experience been similar? Because you do understand the jokes. You have grown up here. Right. So I'll say I've definitely seen it, in a, it evolve a lot over time. And some of it is obviously, you know, my progression of being here and being more accustomed to things around me and understanding them better and uh, kind of immersing myself in that but definitely I've seen it go from people not knowing what Indians were who they were where they were from what their culture was to like now so many years later over time it's gone from like who are you or thinking I'm a Native American and that's the only Indian they knew about to like now being accepted and and they like the yoga they like the meditation they like the food like you know we're, we're so much more accepted than we were when i first came here in the 80s so i've definitely seen that and yet i feel like we're not one of them either because there are times even now my daughters have never been surrounded by too many indians in their schools and stuff so there are times that they they come back and they're like you know I, I feel like I stand out. I, I don't feel like I'm one of them. And, you know, I, I am kind of singled out in a sense. So I've seen kind of like a wide spectrum of even for myself and for the kids being accepted in so many ways and progressing in so many ways and yet having, it's, it's still there. Like it's still real and it's still there. So how do you react when you see other brown people making racist comments and I will be honest I've heard brown people make racist comments about the white race and about the black race what do you usually do and in all honesty there are times when I don't feel comfortable speaking up and I guess that's some place where I need to improve but how has your experience been Sukhreet let's start with you it is kind of in our DNA we have to admit whether we like it or not that uh to, to have funny comments about other people, you know, especially uh, I'll say in the Punjabi community, we have to make fun of everything. So it, it's not about a race. We are not being mean in any, you know, um, maleficent way or anything. But like, like they say very innocently, you know, we don't mean any harm. We are just having fun, you know. And but to the other person, it can really be, you know, hurtful. So we have to realize that even though we are we don't mean it, but even if we are saying it, it might matter, you know, a lot to the other person. And we should think that, okay, what if we were in that situation? You know, maybe the comments which we are making are harmless, but uh, maybe the other person is having a bad day already. And then our comments are just, you know, adding to his grievances. Uh, Nisha, to be honest, I've, I've been, I've, after I came here in United States, I've become very outspoken. You've known me to, through college days. I used to be a very quiet person, but coming here, I've become very outspoken. I speak my mind. I don't hold myself back. And if I see somebody um, 
commenting or I feel it's not appropriate, I do stop them. I, I mean, in a very nice way, <laughs> but I will not, I, I will not stop myself and just be quiet. And I, I will say, you know what? Well, let, me, uh, let me ask you something to that. Does that uh, apply only when you see brown people making fun of other people? Or do you also stand up for other brown people? Like I your do. colleagues are saying something about another brown person. So here's an example I'll give. I go for my hikes in the morning and one day I was just hiking with one of my friends and there was this Asian lady passing by and a car drove by and they shouted across, go back to your country because of COVID. So that's where I, I'm, and I stood up. I, I think they were just driving very slow, but I was like, hey, that's not right. What you're saying, she's not, she's been living here probably more than what you've been living here because these were youngsters, right? And uh, people, as young children, they pick up what happens on their dining tables, how their parents are speaking, what they're talking about. They pick it up and they bring it out in the open. So they, these guys commented out and they said, go back to your country. And I, I guess I didn't stop myself. I was like, wait, hey, that's not right. That's not the right thing to say. Do you think she would be the one who's brought COVID? You can't blame somebody. So you uh, spoke up. Yes. Uh, that's, that's amazing. So, um, I mean, I, I would say I too am pretty outspoken. Um, and I think I learned that I had to be for myself when I first came here as a young girl and I was made fun of plenty. And um, so I learned within months that if I kept taking it and was quiet, they would keep dishing it out. But when I spoke their language back to them, uh, they kind of backed off and they were like, oh, okay, she, she can talk like that too. And she can behave like that too. So I feel like I learned that pretty early on. And ever since then, like my kids say, like, I'm very like aggressive and like, you know, but I don't like usually take it lying down. I mean, we all play around and make fun. I mean, we make fun of ourselves too. And it's fine and fun and games. But when it comes to someone actually really putting someone down, I would say I would definitely speak up and, and I have in the past for ourselves as well as others. Um, yeah, so for me, um, earlier I would, like, yeah, I wouldn't really say much. If I saw other people doing things, like let's say some other brown people saying something bad about other brown people or saying something to them, I probably wouldn't. But I think now I've changed quite a bit. Um, and I would definitely say something. And I have said something like at my workplace, again, like it's not brown versus brown, but it's probably other people like uh, you know, talking about like, let's say names, for example, or just generally, um, you know, talking about somebody because of their race. So like I speak up. Um, yeah, now I don't keep quiet, to be honest. Like I, I would not like, you know, go like, okay, you know, but I would very gently would, would correct people um, and I think if I have to do it less gently I have no problem doing it. So what do you see as the way forward especially as moms of uh, in some of us our case of teenagers and I know Pooja your kids are younger um, but what are we how are we preparing them for this how how do you teach that balance to your kids about when to speak up, when is it okay to let it slide? What's your take on that? Um, I would say, I would always say to speak up. It doesn't mean you have to be aggressive or mean or nasty about it, but I would say if there's something that doesn't sit right with you, you should speak up. And I mean, that's pretty much what I do and my kids see me doing that. so. I, I, now I see Veronica, she's older, and I see she's very outspoken about if she doesn't think, think something's right. I mean, she probably needs to make it a little bit more polite, and like, you know, she, I think she's a little bit more aggressive than even I am at times. But um, I guess they, they've seen that, you know, if I believe something, I say it, and they've kind of, I don't have to tell them as much as they just kind of see it and act the same way that I do in many situations. Yeah, I think our, our kids are more open-minded and they are more clear. And that could be partly because of the baggage or the way we, because we came from uh, such a culture where we are told, okay, you have to respect your elders. You cannot talk back to them or, you know, you cannot talk to them in a certain way, which is 
considered um, insulting to them, even though you are right and they are wrong. Our kids, I think that way, have that much clarity that uh, if they think something is wrong, they will not shy away from that confrontation. So that is something I think, uh, which at least I am learning from my kids personally, that don't don't shy away from any kind of confrontation. If you if you know you are right, stand up for it, you know. Uh, the only thing I tell, okay, so there is a difference. You have to follow the authority. So at home, parents are the authority. In school, teachers are the authority. You you cannot you cannot disobey them. You know. But other than that, if you think something is being done wrong, stand up, and we are we are with you. Yeah, it's a difficult one, Nishta. I think it's there are a lot of things at play. Like you know, going back to a point that Sook made earlier um, that, you know, we are, you know, brown people, we'd like to comment on everything. We we have no problem saying somebody's fat or somebody's too dark. Like, it's just like all a joke for us. Um, but again, like then mm -hmm. there is that gray area where if then a, like, you know, a white person says something about my name, then maybe it's, it's like they're just being very lighthearted like you know then where do you draw the line like it's it's okay for us to do that to each other but if another person is doing that to us then it's wrong like you know so that's one thing and and I'm glad that our kids don't have that like you know my kids don't feel that way they see wrong as wrong whether I'm doing it to another brown person or an, another colored person is doing it to me they just see human being as human beings so I think they're very clear they have that clarity and for me personally I, I actually like I echo your sentiments everybody's sentiments that I tell them if it's wrong you have to speak up like yeah you may choose to and I think they're not quite at that age where they know when to walk away, but I think my next step is to teach them, you definitely make your position known, but also know at the same time when to walk away. I guess I'm sailing in the same boat as uh, Priya. I think Arushi is grown up. I mean, she's 16, so she's at a position where she's able to make her standing and she's very clear about it. And she's very respectful of that. And if there are times when I get called out by her that, mom, that's, that's, that's a comment and that could be taken in a very different way. So you might want to change your, um, the way you've said that sentence. So uh, I think she's in a very good position where she calls out. She's very, I don't have to tell her that you have to stand up. Um, she does it by herself. I don't have to tell her yes to another Pooja's point. I have to agree that they also have to be mature enough where they know when to walk away. They make their standing, they make their point, and then walk away from that and not get into, you know, I mean, they could be repercussions. So one has to be very, um, you know, vigilant of that as well. Where do you draw the line? There is a point that you can make it across and then you draw a line. So I think, yeah, I mean, when I was talking about walking away, not just in terms of repercussions that can happen to you from someone on the outside, I also meant like, I, I know me to Didi and Supreet knew me when I was in university and I was very outspoken and I was very almost perceived aggressive by people. And then I slowly learned to sort of get into that calmer mode. So when I talk about walk away, I also mean walking away from it in your head. Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, being okay with things not being okay, right? Because yes, you can be a crusader, you can be fighting for justice and not just live in this anger of self-righteousness because that is not healthy for anybody. And that doesn't change anything out in the world. So that's something that uh, I think we all need to think about a little more. So my last question to you all would be, what do you see as the most hopeful thing in the future? What gives you the most hope for this whole situation and for the improvement of these race relations? Because when I look into the news, there's just so much bad news out there. Sorry, Nishtha, I'll have to bail out, but I'll continue with, with you later. Okay, bye, nice meeting you guys. Bye. Thank you so much, I'll talk to you later. Sure.
Okay, so we'll go to that question. Like, what is it that gives you the most hope in this current situation? Or if there's nothing, then that's fine too. For me, I think it's, it's right now, it seems pretty desperate because there are so many issues that we didn't really touch upon. Like, you know, it's not just Black Lives Matter. It's now like Islamophobia is one. Like, you know, people don't know what really like brown community is. It's everybody an Islamist. It's everybody someone else. Like, who are these people? So people are still not like, we would like to believe that people know who other people are but most most people don't unfortunately like you know they don't take the time and then where is where is the hope so i think it probably would it looks like to me it might get worse before it gets better and it might sound like a cliche but i like i'm a strong believer in making small changes so i would like to teach my kids and um, like I would personally hope that if I could make that small change, then probably that will have its ripple effect. And if enough people make those small changes, then hopefully we'll have a better future. So I think, again, like, like everything else, hope really lies in, in our kids. Um, because I don't think any politician has any desire to correct any of this. Like, you know, that's that's how world is being run these days it's because of those frictions it's because of you know we always talk about the greed like you know it's because of that greed so nothing is going to change at the top level i agree with what puja is mentioning but i think at the same time um the very first step of any problem is identifying and accepting that there is a problem and because of all these protests and everything uh, i think we are, we are aware, but our kids are also being made aware with all what is going around that, okay, things do exist. And what can they do, even though they are not in a position to do anything right now, but it will be registered in their minds that, okay, these kind of things are, happen in our society. And uh, when they see those people, uh, those kids of those races or those religions around them, then they will... They, they'll realize that, okay, protests are going on about Black Lives Matter or Islamophobia. But I have such good friends who is a Muslim or, you know, who is a uh, Black. And they're, they're nice people. So they'll try to make sense of the situation, the current affairs. And they'll try to actually uh, extrapolate that to their situation in their school, in their classroom. And then they will make their own ignorant or knowledge knowledgeable or whatever little information they have that those kind of decisions and that's how i think their their conditioning will build up and as parents it is our responsibility also to only uh, cl to clear their doubts and to also enforce positive thoughts and positive feelings about those different cultures different religions into them so that they don't grow up to be biased human beings you know so hopefully by doing that uh, these problems can uh, get, at least uh, the intensity can reduce to a certain extent. What gives you hope, Priya? I'm just going to go to a different location because these people are too loud. So give me a second. <laughs> so I would say in terms of um, like hope, I would say it for me, it's been kind of, again, uh, the way that I've been since I moved to Florida. Um, in New Jersey, I had, like growing up, I had so many Indian friends and we, we didn't have enough time to even think about, about anyone outside of Indians because we couldn't even keep up with all the friends we had. So when we moved to Florida, we kind of started new. We didn't really know anyone and we were a lot more open. And so here we have a little bit more diversity in terms of the friends that we entertain and we have and uh, same for the kids so I feel like just it, the environment di dictates a lot as well so um, I feel like it's it's been very nice to be able to be in this environment where I myself am so diverse in the people that I meet in so many walks of life 
um, that they they see that as well. The kids see that, and they they also have the similar environment. So I think it's a lot. They're a lot more accepting, and so are we, just because of the way that you know our environment is. So I think that has a lot to do with it, and uh, that gives me hope that you know we're open to it, and so it, it makes it easier for us to visualize it and see that it is possible to treat people the same and you know, be more open to other cultures and other um, traditions and, and kind of embrace that. Like here in Florida, we uh, met um, really close Jewish friends that we've made and they've been inviting us to a lot of their religious stuff, like all their special holidays. And so we've kind of really learned a lot from that and we've seen the commonalities that we have with them. And uh, we kind of, you know, celebrate that. And they're like so into our culture as well. They love our food, they love our things. So it's nice to see that there are other people out there that have so much in common with you, which we never ever even thought of when we were in New Jersey. Right. No, so that gives me a lot of hope. You know, I just want to touch upon something you said, because that was something that I always used to think about. Because when I moved to North America and I would meet my, uh, my husband's cousins who were born and brought up here, the thing that would strike me uh, the most was that they had a lot of Indian friends. But again, like you said, they didn't have that close friends from other groups. And that sort of always sort of stuck out, even though I was too new here to understand any of that. Um, so I think that's definitely one way to move forward is to actually form these close relationships with other groups to realize that you're just like me. There isn't that yes. much difference, right? Um, yeah, and here I've seen that in a lot of different environments. Uh, I'm on, on a lot of committees through real estate and I meet all kinds of people there and they're from different cultures. We all kind of embrace that. So in so many wave, I've seen, ways I've seen so much inclusion being more diverse with other people, which I never even thought of before. And, right. and uh, that, that's been very up. refreshing. And I think it's also partly opening up ourselves, right? Because I find yes. that the people I get along with the most are usually old white guys. We are very similar here. I'm a brown woman, much younger to them. And these are, you know, older people, older white men that I just totally get along with. And there is this whole stereotyping of old white men as being racist. But right. I don't find that when you actually get to know them. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I've seen, I've become a lot more open since I moved than my whole way of thinking. And when you're open, I think you invite that, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I've received a lot of goodness from other people and a lot more inclusion just because I'm open to it and, and I embrace it. So I, I feel that's that's been really good for me. Right. So I guess as we are coming to the end of this discussion, um, I think I'll just say what gives me hope is that I find that this whole environment of protests and young people, especially like each of you mentioned about your own kids, it's my daughter who comes to me and brings me these uh, petitions to sign on change.org, right? So, that, so the fact that the young people are involved, it reminds me of the times that I wasn't here to witness those times, but these protests in the 60s or the time when women were fighting to get voting rights. This just feels like one of those times when it's very dark, but it's about to get better. And I know, Pooja, you feel like it might get worse. It might, but I just still feel like we are on the precipice of a large change now because it cannot go on any longer because it's all so much in everybody's face. And going to your point, Sook, where you said that you have to admit the problem. And I think now we are finally admitting the problem. So that gives me a lot of hope. Thank you so much for doing this. I think this was, um, this was one of those topics I was the most scared to touch and uh, I did not feel comfortable approaching too many people about this. So I'm just so glad that you all agreed to do it. I hope it was good for you too. And I think we'll cut it was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank I you. I think it was an excellent discussion and I think we all probably learned something and got something from it. So I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.